Hello and welcome to India Questions. It is very, very rare, and this program has been around for a long time, to get, in my opinion, two of the really greatest human beings that we have living on this planet uh, today, and both together, and they've never been together before, <laughs> although I've had them individually, uh, and they have so much in common. Bill Gates and Amir Khan. Polio worldwide uh, last year was less than 300 cases. It's only in three countries and I spend the majority of my time on polio because we've orchestrated a, a six-year campaign. We uh, feel that malnutrition is a big problem that India is facing and we want you to work in that area. Great. Uh, so I was you know, quite impressed because they were across parties and there was obviously nothing political happening over yeah. here. Right. So I have another question. Uh, young girl in yellow there at the back, yeah. Um, see, uh, I have this question. Uh, whenever I see, I mean, when we picture, when we take newspaper in the morning, I see the, the two different worlds we are living in. In one world, we have people like Amir Khan and Mr. Gates, where we, they're trying to make it a better place. But then again, they have this, you know, you have this business world, all this. Uh, uh, trips going on and where we are trying to curb the production of generic drugs which is very very important for certain people for example HIV AIDS patients uh, the drugs which are produced in India uh, they are very important for patients in uh, uh, certain African countries and of course world over so uh, there's always also this uh, campaign going against uh, production of these generic drugs and Cheaper to extend drugs. the IPRs and uh, um, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but then uh, there's always a dualism in everything. So uh, how do you think, can we tackle this thing? That I mean, is this is a very question. important aspect of health. You know, if you allow generic drugs and copying, then you won't get so much investment and research. And, but on the other hand, if you go to the other stream, other extreme, then you get drugs that are far too expensive for most of the population to use. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is a, it's a tough one, but as far as I understand it, when you, when you patent a drug or when you come out with a new drug, I think that, that you are allowed to use it, uh, you know, without it going generic for about 10 years. There's a particular period in which right, you can right. uh, earn, you know, as but a India, company, you can India, we kind of found a loophole and, around it. And India. then after 10 years or, or a certain period, then it's allowed to go generic. If I'm not mistaken, that's, yeah, yeah, it's that is what that, is yeah. followed. Which seems to me a, a, a fairly good model. And uh, because it's important for companies to invest in research and development and, and for them to earn, I suppose, back what they have uh, invested. At the same time, the benefit of that should ultimately also come to people who are right. less privileged. And, and I think generic medicines in that sense is, is, is very important. I mean, what we see is happening in Rajasthan today and uh, is, is quite amazing. They, the government in Rajasthan has... has uh, uh, shops, the government has opened shops all across the state in which they supply generic medicines and they have a department uh, which purchases medicines from all these various big companies, pharmaceutical companies and at very it. low rates and subsidizes it and sells it. it gives it free actually. Okay. Yeah. What's your answer to that? It's a, it's a tough question. Well actually the the ideal system is fairly clear which is that even during the period that they have their patent, mm. uh, that the poorest should just uh, either get it free, subsidized by the government, or pay the marginal cost, so the lowest cost possible. For the poor. And then people who have higher incomes need to pay a higher price because, after all, we want these research activities to invent new medicines, more right. vaccines, more drugs. And so what's been done, which is very imperfect, is that the U.S. pays over 70% of the profit margin on medicines comes from buyers in the U.S. and then other, other rich countries are some of that. A and so it's been done sort of on a country by country basis where you know, countries in Africa all get this very low price. Now India somewhat complicates the picture because you can't really pick the right price for, in for India because it has a middle class that should probably contribute to the research and it's got uh, uh, poor people who should get the very lowest price. So figuring out how you differentiate the private system versus the state system for India, it's, it's tricky. But I feel like we will be able to strike a balance here. Mm. 
Uh, after all, you want lots of research jobs in India. A lot of these uh, great drug and vaccine companies are right. now growing up in, in the country. And of course, in India, it's difficult to identify who's rich and who's poor when you're actually doling out medicine. So we have this Aadhaar system. But, uh, Nandan Nilekani is working on a system right. where you will be, uh, actually identify and target the poor and target the rich separately. Unless you do that, you wouldn't be able to provide subsidized medicines and mm -hmm. uh, full price medicines. So it's a complex issue that requires, yeah. but the solution is in sight. The right? principle, yeah. The principle, right, yes. <laughs> Whether the solution or not. Yes, sir, in front. You're not a young student, but no, no, uh, you're about a uh, little older than Amir, I think. <laughs> My age. I'm Rajiv. I'm a, I'm a pediatrician, a doctor who trained in the U.S. and returned to this country about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, the whole issue that we are all discussing here, whose responsibility is to protect the children? Mm -hmm. India produces, uh, we have 27 million babies who are born in this country. We have 440 million children. So we are creating one Australia every year. So the, the thing is, if we, if, we, if, we, if we say it's the government's responsibility alone, it, 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 you cannot achieve those goals. But if all of us collectively, like you said just now, and the proximate community where the children are born, say the panchayats in the villages. Mm -hmm. So what we have done is a group has adopted a village called Bango, which is about 70 kilometers from Delhi. And we can go there weekly and make our visits. And, and it's just been a wonderful, a, a shining example because not only we have seen the survivals improving over there, but children are now in school because we are looking beyond survival into child development. So, so, are you so suggesting this is something that everybody should do. I think one should Adopt reach out to nearby. the communities. We have to do it. How Either many of you actually do some kind of social work? Go out to villages once in a while. Oh, that's a good number, yeah. That's about 70%, and the other 30% are the honest ones. <laughs> <laughs> Who but what was your not? question? Did you have a question, sir? Sir, yeah. sir? My question was this. Whose responsibility is to protect the children? I personally am trying to find my own answers. And my, my, my question is, whose responsibility? The problem is big. You cannot blame the government. Yeah. Uh, we need to contribute. So whose responsibility it is to take care of these children? Like vaccinations are one of the most effective preventive uh, ways of you know, but there's an expense to it, and, and government sometimes is not able to pay. Then right. who's, who's supposed to do it? Our okay, community, our proximate community? You asked for the question. Now. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think when it comes to health care and it comes to payment of uh, vaccines for, for the poor children who can't afford it, perhaps, then that certainly should be paid. I mean, we are all paying our taxes in any case, either directly or indirectly. And I think the wealth that is accumulated by the country every year is not a small amount. Certainly, we should, uh, we should be using uh, enough of it to make sure that our children uh, have the right to health, you know, from the time that they are born or from the time even before they are born. And that right can be, you know, in the amount that we decide to spend on them, that can be taken care of. Bill Gates, whose responsibility? How much is it of our, as individuals, our responsibility? Well, for immunization, to have that system that reaches out and gets every child, that really... Uh, falls, that's primary health care, and it's a public good. It falls pretty squarely on the government. Uh, now, they can use NGOs or private sector to help Which them a little a lot, bit, yeah. but it's up to them, and they should be elected or not based on that. But as was said, the parent needs to be educated, you know, mm. whether it's nutrition or exclusive breastfeeding that you talked about. Uh, often, women's groups are very powerful to get the word out mm. about these best practices, and, and those are often kind of grassroots organized at the village level without, without the government uh, mm. having to play much of a role at all. Are any of these problems intractable? Uh, I think I've heard you say that we've got deaths mainly due to diarrhea, pneumonia and malaria. Diarrhea you seem to be now taking on at least one form of it pretty effectively, very soon. Malaria has been a ongoing problem. Yeah, malaria on a global basis is a big killer. A little bit less in India, but that's a huge investment and uh, there's new drugs and there's hope that if we can get polio done that will have the credibility and energy and a few new tools uh, then the world will go out and take on uh, malaria eradication as the next big global campaign. Okay. But DDT is... DDT kills mosquitoes and so you can cut the rate uh, a biting down, 
Uh, the other new tool that's, that's uh, very powerful is called a bed net. So you sleep under this bed net mm. at night. And right. so all the mosquitoes that bite you at yes. night not only are blocked from doing that, but there's insecticide there that's actually killing those mosquitoes. That's brought the death rate down from about a million a year worldwide uh, to under 700,000. But we need a few more tools before we can push down and, and have the goal of, of zero in mind. And are mosquitoes now immune against DDT? Yeah, if, it's a strange thing. If you use DDT intensely, then the mosquitoes will uh, evolve so that they are, uh, it doesn't kill them. Because we haven't used DDT much recently, uh, they've forgotten they, about it. Yeah, <laughs> they've evolved back to be DDT sensitive. And, and so for indoor spraying, DDT is, is fantastic. Okay. It, it was viewed as a mistake to use it in agriculture because mm. it was causing some problems. Right. But using it against mosquitoes in a targeted way actually works very well. Okay, great, great. It's young lady in front here. Thank you. Um, my comment entails a critique of the media and especially television and radio because I think these uh, media lack the rigor and the nuance that subjects like sanitation and malnutrition require. I also think Very that the true. debates around sanitation and malnutrition in media remain sanitized of topics like caste and religion because what we don't hear is that at an Anganwadi or a nutrition center which is dominated by upper caste, a Muslim woman and a Dalit woman feels discouraged to even take her child for that vaccination and what we also do not hear is that if we are giving toilet loans to poor people in Bihar then we are probably giving a second toilet loan to somebody who already has a toilet but excluding a Muslim person or a Dalit person who does not own that piece of land that he or she is living on which is a mandatory requirement in giving out that toilet loan so I think that we would as concerned uh, participants in this nation building, we would like to see um, the news media, our actors, our philanthropists engage the middle classes um, on these issues. So probably the next advertisement that you do or the next proposal that you um, sign off or the next show that NDTV does, you know, these issues along caste and religion need to be discussed more explicitly because right. if there is one medium that can change mindsets um, powerfully, um, that is the medium of television and um, radio. Um, I'd That's be keen to hear I your comments. Yeah. Amir? Yeah, I think the media has a very important role to play in that. I completely agree with what she's saying. So I think the media does have an important role to play and I too would like to see more of that. Um, I hope today is an example of that. Yeah. Uh, at least you spoke. <laughs> <laughs> carry on, carry on. Sorry. Yeah, no, I think what you're saying is right, and 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 we need to do more of that. Uh, the, uh, the media is doing a fair amount, but I think that. But uh, she's saying it doesn't really. It sort of skirts around. It the does. Issue, it does. It I really think she's go. right. No, I think yeah. she's right. We don't. We don't give it enough value. Uh, it. You know, we don't. We don't. We don't give it the edge that it. It really has already. I, I think that's news actually also. You know, because a lot of media feel that oh, we need to sell our newspaper as well, or my channel needs to have TRP, which I completely understand. But you I know, think that these are newsworthy things. That
partner, which was AA. AA was our partner. They came on to give us a lot of information and help and etc. And, and as you all know, at the end of the episode, we would always donate a lot of money. You know, pe people would donate. You know, right. uh, viewers from all over the country would donate to that organization. And AA refused to be take money because they said, our policies, we don't take money. So they didn't take money, but how we work together, which is what gave us the idea for the following season is AA and all its members, you know, organized themselves. And on the show, we told, we gave the information about AA and said, here is a number. If you have a problem with alcohol and if you, if you feel you need help, right. this is the number to call. I think they had 30,000 members up till now. Right. in the last 65 years of their existence in India. I think in, in about two weeks they had some three lakh, 300,000 calls. Tremendous. So, so that's the one way now to when get you, people When you help one there. alcoholic person, right. you help not only that person, but you help their entire family. Yeah, huge. So, you, huge you know, so what AA is doing is really amazing. And we were the wire media who could spread that information and yeah. bring people right. together who are wanting and able to help to people who need help. Now that is something that happened organically in the case of that particular episode. But we want to replicate that for our season two in, in all the various topics. I have you just know. one last question which is totally different from everything else we've talked about. It's something else you get emotional about. Would you like to have seen Steve Jobs here? Well, what Steve, would you have said to him in this whole process in chapter two? Well, Steve uh, you know, did brilliant work in the IT industry and it was a pleasure to uh, partner with him on the Mac, you know, compete with him, uh, and he was a brilliant designer, uh, and I'm sure he would have gone on to do great things in other areas. Probably so he would have joined you uh, in I this don't know. new venture. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a tragedy he's not here so we can see what his uh, great sense of aesthetics and justice would have uh, uh, let him do in the next days of his life. You miss him? I, I miss uh, working with him, and I got to see him quite a bit. Uh, in the last year, and he and I got to talk about things. Uh, Wonderful. But, uh, you know, he, he was a very unique person. Yeah. We all miss him, actually. What a man. Okay, quick question. Sir, uh, I live in that region of Punjab where hepatitis C is really, very really widespread, and my own dad has undergone vaccination therapy. So, uh, in hepatitis C, there is a risk that the pregnant woman may transmit that to the fetus. Okay, and uh, secondly, it is like if she undergoes the vaccine therapy, so she is advised not to get pregnant because the child is at the risk of uh, developing birth defects. So, what she can do? A vaccine, uh, which is being worked on, would prevent people from getting it in the first place. Uh, in parallel with that, there's people working on so-called antiviral drugs uh, that would help people who actually have the infection. As yet, they're, they're quite complex and quite expensive. And so unfortunately, it's probably going to be a while before, before we have a broad widespread. therapies. It's, it's being worked on, uh, but that's, that's a tough one. Hepatitis B, you know, we got the vaccine for, but hepatitis C is right on the medical frontier. Okay, great. Round of applause and whoever wants to dance with Amir, come and dance. Let's have the music. Jump tight, oh, out of control. Oh, toko karke gol. Kuch kita, kuch kita, kuch kita. Yeah. Oh, toko karke gol. Siti baja ke bol. Kuch kita, kuch kita, kuch kita. Yeah.